Thank you. Yep, right here. You I know how to work. Yep. Yes, uh, I'm Ken Judd at the Hoover Institution. Um, the PI is Lars Hansen, who is busy right now because last fall he won the Nobel Prize in Economics. And of course, that makes, um, that really clogs up your schedule. Um, so, um, by the way, I want to, the title of the slide, Computation Models for Economics, uh, I, I, uh, I'm going to try to have the slide from the first presentation this morning corrected because in that pie chart, there is nothing that said economics. But this is really economics. It probably got, I don't know, classified under something else, but this is economics. Um, now, uh, economics is a complex system. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to dispute that. Even economists don't dispute it. Um, but when you actually look at the way they do research, typically, um, they, they just look at highly stylized, simple models of, let's say, some feature of the economy. Um, uh, it's, remember the, the story about four blind men studying an elephant? They come, well, okay, this is like 20 um, men with their, and people with their eyes closed studying a 20-dimensional elephant, or worse. Um, and because there's a great preference to uh, pencil and paper and then computational tools like uh, uh, laptops and slide rules and things like that. Um, I, yesterday there was one talk that said that they were the best team working in uh, their area on the, on the supercomputer. I can say that even more definitively because we're the only people in economics working on any supercomputer. Um, so now we're trying to change that um, and create robust and general tools for a variety of uh, economics problems. Now the, uh, the example that you're going to see today is one that the NSF will give a little money for, uh, having to do with climate change. Um, but basically, uh, okay, that's, that's an application. The, the tools that we're developing here um, are related to most of dynamic economics. In particular, Young Yang Kai, who's one of, who does a lot of the programming in his PhD thesis, talked about, uh, asked the question, um, would, would the economy be better if we got rid of all those derivatives? You know those derivative things that kind of messed things up in 2008 and all that? Would, should we get rid of them and actually try to measure the value of having them in the marketplace? So that's the kind of questions we can start asking now that we have access to the big machines. Um, I should point out, Young Yang is, wave your hand, Young Yang <laughs> um, is, is doing a lot of the program. Also, uh, Simon Scheidegger, um, over there um, is also a part of the team. Um, uh, Simon is from University of Zurich, a postdoc there. Um, and actually, the people on my team are, oh, a couple, yeah, some guys at University of Zurich. Um, Young Yang, who gets paid by Chicago, but he actually sits out at Hoover Institution with me. Um, uh, and then also some undergraduates at BYU. Um, basically, young people. And so uh, trying to sort of build up the expertise among the younger people going into economics. And by young, I mean before they go to graduate school because then it's too late. Um, because basically, when you think about the complexity of economics, and if you um, looked at the mathematical nature of most of what's going on in economics and the computational nature um, and compare it to what you are doing, you would come to the conclusion that economics is a joke. Now some of you may have even read a little bit about it a year ago about some famous paper, some important paper. They found some errors in it and reversed results having to do with recommendations about uh, how to deal with the financial crisis. This paper argued for austerity, published in 2010, and then they found a lot of errors in it about a year ago, um, a couple of Harvard economists, and people say, oh, that's kind of a scandal that they were so sloppy. The big scandal is that the entire um, the analysis was done in an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> that is, 
economics. Most economists use something more than Excel spreadsheets, but that's the, um, it's all laptop economics. Um, and we're trying to change that. So, now, um, now the application is how should we respond to the rise in CO2 in the atmosphere? Now, the typical um, models that are used in, um, for this question, um, including um, the models that, model that was used by the U.S. government interagency task force, um, published, they had a report in 2010, um, the, the, both the economic models and the climate models are, are, very, are very trivial, um, the, um, which might be okay, but, but for example, the, uh, the system that they're describing is actually a pair of differential equations. Um, however, they um, don't, is they, they used, I guess to be generous, I would say they used a finite difference approach, um, but with 10 year time steps, and also the finite difference approach on the climate side seemed to indicate, seemed to imply that future CO2 would start warming the atmosphere today. Um, the, whatever, whatever scheme they came up with, it was just something they wrote down um, that had no mathematical foundation in any sort of numerical analysis. I mean, I don't think the guys even know what a differential equation is. Um, but anyway, so um, that's the, uh, the level of analysis in that report. Um, now, the, uh, so they're all deterministic, so the assumption is in these models is that we, we, can, we know exactly where the economy is going to be for every year for the next 600 years, and also we can figure out the climate. Um, that's not realistic. Um, this is the uh, uh, Nordhaus at Yale is the guy who has pr pr produced this model that people use. DICE stands for Dynamic Integration of Climate and Economy. And the features of the model are pretty much um, pretty basic. On the economic side, in each period of time, you have some capital stock, machines, etc. And then there's some population L, and then there's, um, and then the population L may change over time, and so does the capital stock, and then so does productivity, because we're getting more productive over time. But basically, given the capital stock at time T, this is the output. So this is macroeconomics, where everything can be lumped together in one output thing. So and then the climate through temperature can damage the production process, reduce um, the you know, output from what it would be if there wasn't any um, problem with temperatures. Then there's some money that's spent to reduce emissions. Um, so basically, the economic side of this is really just a one-dimensional dynamical system because um, K, the capital stock, is the only thing that moves over time in a dynamic, I mean, endogenous fashion. The climate system in that model, which basically Nordhaus got from um, Schneider, so it, its lineage is somewhat respectable, but Schneider's papers were, dis were differential equations. Um, and you have three states of the climate system, three carbon masses, atmosphere, um, upper ocean, lower ocean, and then there are two um, uh, temperatures, uh, the atmospheric temperature and the, and the lower ocean temperature. So this is a five-dimensional dynamical system. And um, then here's a, a carbon, CO2 emissions are related to exogenous sources from land and then also some related to the economy. And then there's radiative forcing um, that's heating things up and interacting with the carbon. Um, so this is basically, if you, it's a six-dimensional um, uh, differential equation, which you then control. So this is optimal control. You have this six-dimensional um, object uh, system, and then you control things like how much you consume today versus how much you save for tomorrow, how much you spend on mitigation, what tomorrow's capital stock is. So it's an optimal control problem. Um, and then here's a... Um, when I started collaborating with some applied mathematicians some, 10 years ago, they always said, Ken, you have to have pictures. Anyway, so here's a picture of that system. Um, the, you have the economy, you have business cycle that kicks the economy around, and then the economy spits out CO2, that affects the atmosphere directly, and then um, CO2 diffuses between the atmosphere and the ocean, and then you have the temperature, um, 
interaction um, and diffusion, and then that damages the economy. Now, the one thing that we're adding here that is not done in uh, um, economics models, or in these IAM models, integrated assessment models, is that we are adding in the possibility of abrupt climate change. And those would be things like, suppose all of a sudden um, uh, the, uh, the big piece of the Western Antarctic ice sheet um, broke off and melted, um, and, or, or then re resulted in large uh, rise in sea level. Well, that's, um, once we start seeing it happen, we probably wouldn't have much warning until it really does happen, so it's on the time scale we're talking about, it's abrupt, and also it's irreversible. It's like once that ice melts, it's going to take a long time before the ice refreezes, so it's irreversible. Um, whereas the damage functions typically are just reversible. So that, and also we're going to have it that it's an uncertain thing. It's that the probability of a bad thing like this happening depends on the temperature. So we can't predict for sure. So that's the structure of the model. And, um, and what we're doing is we're adding in um, shocks to the economy of the, of the normal kind that it's, is studied in macroeconomics. We also don't know exactly what the parameters are for any of these systems. Um, and uh, so those are the levels of uncertainty and that's what we're dealing with. Um, now, here is, okay, I think, okay, here's the math part problem. We have um, a state, we have a state variable. Actually, there's a total of nine states because there's one capital stock, three M's, two T's, and then these are um, variables related to the um, unstochastic element of, these are just random variables that are kicking, being kicked around. And then uh, what we do is we solve what's called the Bellman equation. Now, Bellman equation, dynamic programming, this is the discrete time analog of what is called in uh, continuous time control the Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equations. And Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equations are basically um, um, parabolic, um, differential, parabolic partial differential equations, um, and, but where you have a terminal condition for, uh, for your, in the initial condition you have a terminal condition and then you solve backwards, this is just a discrete time version. There's some function v, and you, you, if you know what v is at time t plus one, then by solving this optimization problem, you know what it is at time t, and you iterate um, until you get to today. And we do over 600 time periods. So why 600? Well, 600 is what Nordhaus does in his papers, or used to do. So, you know, if we did much less than that, they'd say, well, you know, Nordhaus did 600. Why can't you do it? So, you know, it's just that, that's the reason we do 600. One year time periods. Um, Nordhaus did 10 year time periods um, and others do like 20 or 30 year time periods. One year time periods. Because that's, at, when you're trying to talk about economic uncertainty, any, any longer time period than one year is, doesn't make any sense. Um, and so, so it's, it's um, yeah, so it's a control problem and given your, given your state today, you solve an optimization problem, and then uh, you have a payoff today, and then a discounted um, operator, uh, discount, discounted value of some operator on tomorrow's V function, value function. So um, that's what it is, numerical dynamic programming. Now the key thing is that what we do is we take the state space, which like I said is nine dimensional, and we break it up into lots and lots of points. And then at each one of the, at each point here, suppose we're, suppose we're at time 37, we, 30, t plus one is 37, and so now we're down at time 36. So we take a whole lot of points in z space and solve this optimization problem. And then when we solve all those optimization problems, like this, we then gather things together and use interpolation methods, approximation methods to gather up and by regression or whatever, compute the time t value function. So that's a standard structure here. Uh, what's novel about this relative to uh, other dynamic programming pay, um, work is that this expectation is really an integral and this, the, the, the integrand here is a smooth function and so we take advantage of the very efficient ways there are to solve multidimensional function uh, integrals, not Monte Carlo, not quasi Monte Carlo. We use monomial rules that are designed for um, those um, functions of that dimension. Um, and then we continue. Now, 
By the way, I should, um, we, we, we use the language master worker in describing our computational work, and that's because we first implemented this um, on the Condor cluster at Madison, courtesy of Marone Livney. So we use what's called the master worker paradigm in Condor, and that's why we have this language. And that, so basically, one simple way is that the master head sends out all these, in, all these problems we solve by the workers, and then the master then gathers up and then does the regression. Well, this is too big for that. So we have, I don't know what we're supposed to say, master, submaster worker, or anyway, master overseer worker, anyway. Um, so then basically we, the master take, sends out a chunk and then to some master, some master sends it out to workers and then coordinate things. Um, so um, like I said, this is basically nine dimensions. Three of the dimensions are discretized, but the other ones are approximated with continuous functions, actually Chebyshev polynomials. Um, and uh, actually complete Chebyshev polynomials, not tensor product, but complete ones because that's far more efficient. Um, that's one of the things we're doing here is we, when we do these things, we know we're approximating a smooth function, so let's learn what the best way is for, from approximation theory for doing that. Numerical integration, let's use the best quadrature methods. And then when it comes to the optimization problems, we use um, one of the best solvers for that, uh, NP Sol at, out of Stanford. And so here's the scale of what we're doing. Number of nodes, 2600, uh, you know, CPU times 77 hours, uh, but wall clock time is eight hours. So this is um, easily on the scale of, uh, oh yeah, the total number, the, you see basically what's happening here is we're trying to solve this dynamic optimization problem over 600 periods. But it breaks down into lots of little itty bitty optimization problems, nonlinear optimization with an expensive function evaluation, so they're not totally trivial. But then we break it down to this and then, and then each worker ultimately does some of those problems, over the course of 600 periods, it's 372 billion of these nonlinear constrained optimization problems that are being solved. Um, so, but, but that's the advantage of dynamic programming is you have something which is big and looks ridiculously difficult, but you can break it into pieces and 372 billion optimization problems done in uh, wall clock time eight hours. So this is on the scale where I would not want to do this on um, grid computing. One thing we do is we don't know about parameters. There's a lot of uncertainty about the parameter values. So what we're doing is uh, creating, um, evaluating the solutions for our problem on, a, on 400, 401 parameter cases in six dimensions using Smuliak grid approximations. And then, um, and then, and in this case, use 3,700 cores and Anyway, so there you see the time it takes. And then also this gives us sort of a, a, what's, what's called a response surface. Um, that tells you what the, the map is from parameter value to something you're interested in. In this case, the carbon tax at time zero. And, uh, and then once we do this, this may seem like a small sample in six dimensions, but then what we do is then we take a random draw from the space and see how well we fit that we solve it on those random, and then we find out that the errors, that the fit that we get is really quite good. Um, now here's, a, if you wanna see some economic results, um, I won't go into the economics here, but there's a, a, one of the critical parameters on the economic side is a parameter called psi, and you know, there's, there's no way we can pin it down by, by empirical evidence as to whether it's this one or this one, but notice that the optimal carbon tax at time like today, 2014, the optimal carbon tax today varies a great deal depending on that parameter. So there's a, the parameter sensitivity to, um, and gamma is another parameter in, uh, on, the, on the utility function side. Um, so just the enormous sensitivity to the assumptions about the utility function is clearly seen here. However, the standard in economics is to pick one set of parameters one value for each parameter and then argue that for, on some basis that that's the best. It's like maybe it's a best, but it's not much of a, con it, you know, it's like they're all kind of good and fuzzy and uh, I'm sort of a Bayesian by philosophy and so I hate that approach of picking one number. And so we're doing uncertainty quantification. Um, and sensitivity, this is an example of the dynamic paths of social cost of carbon. The key thing here, this is log base 10, the key thing here is that um, 
about 10%, this, this area, is, this is 90%, this is 99%, about 10% of the time, at year 2100, the social cost of carbon will be $1,000 a ton. And what that tells us is that this is all carbon tax. You have to go beyond carbon tax. This means that certainly CCS would be um, valuable. Now, um, okay, so uh, then um, basically in economics, we have these value, these functional iterations in the Bonnock space. Uh, Simon is working on um, using sparse grids. He is able to use GPUs. GPUs um, improved the speed up on a piece of it by a factor of 10, overall by a factor of three. The other thing is that um, when you're doing economics, you also end up having to try to think about how decisions are made and games. I mean, what the political decisions are really outcomes of games. So we can solve games that on the scale that are gonna be relevant again here. The amount of time that's needed to solve even simple games is enormous, but that's what needs to be done. And, um, and again, parallelism works well. And the scaling there is also excellent linear. Um, and the, other, the last thing I want to say is that the, a lot of these problems we've done right now has strict, sort of some strict synchronization. Many of these things can be, have much weaker synchronization. Some can be done purely asynchronously without any loss of accuracy. So the, the supercomputer like this is, I think, quite the place, right, correct place to do these things. Thank you.